the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. For those of you visiting today, you're in for a little more than you anticipated. Uh, this is the Sunday where not only do we have our annual meeting, uh, but I also give a little bit of a sermon that's uh, also sort of a state of the parish address. So uh, maybe it's a great Sunday to be visiting, to hear a little bit more about St. James and the year we've had and the year we anticipate. But I'll start with the readings. So one of the readings for today is just plain difficult for me to believe. And the other is a story about a man who spent three days inside the belly of a large fish. So Jonah. God speaks to him and God says, Jonah, I need you to do a big job for me. I need you to go to Nineveh and I need you to tell those people, your sworn enemy, that they need to repent or I'll destroy them. And Jonah, both out of uh, a lack of appreciation for him and out of fear, says, absolutely not. I'm getting as far away as I possibly can. And he goes and he stows off on a boat to Tarshish. And then God finds him, because God does that. And so the waves start to rise up, and the boat's tossing and turning. They're throwing their cargo overboard. And finally, they're drawing lots, figuring uh, the person that gets the short straw must be responsible for it. That falls on Jonah, and he says, yes, it's me. I'm trying to run away from God. Throw me in the water, and the, the waves will cease. They're reluctant, but eventually they throw him in, and the second he hits the water, the, the water's calm. Um, but lucky, luckily for Jonah, a giant fish just happens to be there, swallows him whole, and he spends three days in that belly talking to God. It is hard to imagine what it must have been like to get spit out and then to have God ask you again a second time. Jonah, will you go? Will you do what I've asked you to do? Will you go to your sworn enemy and tell them to repent, to change their ways? And after three days in the belly of a fish, he says, sure. And he goes, and he tells the people of Nineveh exactly what he's supposed to, probably kind of like this, God told me to come and tell you that you need to repent, and probably walking backwards as he does it. And amazingly, they repent, which gets him even hotter. He is furious. Now they've repented, and God has changed his mind and isn't going to destroy him. That's more realistic, isn't it? Isn't that kind of how we operate than the gospel story? where somehow somebody who happens to be God in the flesh walks by and says, leave your livelihood, take everything you know, everything you depend on, everything your family depends on, and leave it and just follow me. It just doesn't seem as much like human nature. So I think the Jonah story is not just about uh, God's expansive love, about God's love breaking beyond uh, Israel itself to uh, to all people, but it's also about human nature. And that's why we understand it, even though it has uh, three days in a belly of a fish. And even though this story is much more plausible in its sense of reality, it's much harder to believe that they would just drop everything and follow. By the time Luke gets around to telling the story, he must have realized that people are struggling with it because Luke says, well, this is what happened. They were fishing all night. They didn't catch a single fish. They're coming back to shore. Jesus is talking, and he tells them, go back out into the deep water where you're not supposed to find fish during a time that's not very conducive to fishing, and cast your nets again. And they say, we've been up all night. Just let us go home. And he says, do it. And they do it. And the nets get so overfilled with fish that the nets start to break, and they start to get them in the boat, and the boat starts to sink, and so they got to get their friends, and they catch all of these fish to the point where they say, this is not an ordinary human, and this is not an ordinary call. And if this God who can do this wants me to do something special, has a special job in store for me, I will listen. You see, this is what happens. I don't really preach with notes very often, so now I'm going to have to find out where I am. Um, <laughs> that brings us to today. As a mainline church leader in 2018, with national trends pointing in the wrong direction, and more outside distractions and activities pulling attention and commitment away from the church, 
I really have to marvel at the ways that we do follow this gospel lesson, the way that we do say yes to God, the way that we do follow faithfully. I don't intend to go through a detailed account of all that's occurred in the past year, which I have done in years past sometimes. But please know that this was a remarkable year. As we heard in the annual meeting, a surprisingly, almost miraculous year. We spent much of the start of the year kicking off what would become the largest capital campaign in our parish's history, and we exceeded our goal. We did this while the leadership of the parish was reeling, responding to the loss of over 20% of our pledged income in one single pledge. Leaning on the abundance of years past, on our faith in the Lord who said, come follow me, we stepped out. We pared down our budget, we cut wherever we could, and we still had a budget that anticipated a very significant deficit. And as you heard, we ended the year in the black. As you have seen, and you will hear, or you heard during the annual meeting, we have now broken ground, we've weathered the first major financial hardship in our five years together, and then, beyond that, we went to Holy Week. This may have been the most moving Holy Week in my ordained life. And it was not an accident. Through intentional discussions with our worship committee about Holy Week's past, about why we do the things we do, about how we can incarnate what actually takes place in those Holy Week services and in those moments, through our uh, adult formation team committing to uh, having the parish read Marcus Borg and John Crossum's The Last Week and discussing what it is theologically that happens on each of those days. As people like Jesse and the choir tirelessly rolled up their sleeves day after day, <coughs> as Randolph planned uh, and made uh, changes to liturgy, brought his past experience to life, as Jeff, our seminarian, experienced Holy Week in a whole new way, as countless, countless volunteers offered their times it made for a moving and transformative Holy Week that truly made those last days that changed the world forever, change the world forever. As I said, it may be the richest Holy Week in my ordained life. We followed that up with the graduation of our third and largest fifth grade class at St. James Episcopal School. And after a summer of energizing vacation Bible school, where our own Scott Christian played Paul, and a powerful, powerful mission trip to South Carolina where I watched uh, children when I got here, adults and leaders amongst the youth. We returned to the fall, continuing our increased vigor for adult education. Having read seven books over the course of the year, we established for the first time, and at least uh, as far as I know, our EFM program, an education for ministry program where people could dig deeper in faith. We began with the largest pool of youth in our middle school and high school youth program. And the vestry explored the incredible breadth and commitment of our servant ministries, of the way that we walk outside these doors and we do God's work in the world. And we asked the leaders of those particular ministries a few questions, a few intentional questions. How do they provide much needed resources or services for those in particular need? How do we meet the needs of the world? A gospel call. Question number two, how do we use or utilize the unique gifts and talents within our parish? How do we ask people not just to give money, uh, but to roll up their sleeves uh, to appreciate and inventory the gifts that we have within this parish so that our outreach can ask people to offer those gifts, offer those gifts that God has given them for a particular reason to the service of others? And then thirdly, how do we do this with a sense of oneness? How do we engage in ministry that allows us to be in solidarity with the people that we serve, that we serve beside, not to, and certainly not down to? How do we understand and learn more about our brothers and sisters and work with them to build up the kingdom of God here on earth? This process not only affirmed the remarkable reach of our parish beyond these doors, uh, but it helped us to be able to uh, more, more effectively recruit others and to help newcomers uh, be able to engage in these ministries. Uh, but it also helped us understand how the leadership of the church can more fully equip these groups for ministry. On the heels of this, 
We led an exploratory trip to Haiti where we intentionally read together and studied together and committed together that this trip was not about what we could do or accomplish, but how we could be with, how we could grow and understand, and what seeds we might be able to plant for a future day. And we learned quite a bit about our brothers and sisters in Haiti. We learned how our story has had effects on their story. And now we have the opportunity to have our story have a positive effect on their story. And their story have a positive effect on ours. And we're looking to form a school relationship uh, with the people there in Haiti. Uh, the fall wrapped up with one of the <laughs> busiest Christmas celebrations in my memory with four Advent uh, falling on the same day as Christmas Eve. So we had five services, five beautiful, well-attended, abundant, and beautiful services celebrating Christmas in 24 hours. Now, I know that was about as quick a triptych as one can take through the year, but I want to go back now to that Sea of Galilee, those shores. And I can never picture Jesus walking along those shores uh, of Galilee again uh, without picturing my time there and, and what it was like and, and how it must have felt uh, to have Jesus walking along those shores saying, come, follow me, and what risk there was uh, uh, in saying yes. And I want to end by showing a few nuggets of ways that you all have shown me what that yes looks like, what that deep leap of faith looks like. 2017 was not without challenges. I mentioned the financial and uh, getting our project off the ground was huge, but one of the greatest challenges, not unique to St. James, uh, but certainly facing us squarely, is programming, planning worship, planning activities, and being church with more and more distractions. Despite 40 baptisms over the last two years and steady congregational growth, our attendance in worship, in children's programming, at our parish retreat, and other activities declined in 2017. I know in my own family, we've had increased difficulty being as fully present and engaged as we had in years past. There's just more going on in our children's lives. And the question facing us, it's a question that we have to answer. In 2018, uh, it should be at the front of our, uh, of our eyes, is how do we elbow in or reclaim more space in people's lives? Or how do we figure out more creative and adaptable ways to be the church without compromising what it is to be the church, to be the kind of community uh, that takes care of one another, the kind of community that lifts each other up in faith, the kind of community that challenges, challenges each other in faith. We can dispense information electronically in other ways, uh, but how do we be, become and maintain our identity as a sacred community amidst all of the other distractions? It requires more and more people to say, I will follow. I will put my nets down and I will follow. So a few examples. Can't get any farther than the music program. I cannot tell you how often uh, I walk outside my door and uh, Anna will say, what's going on at the church? And I'll be, oh, the choir's practicing again. The choir's practicing again. I'm starting to count my hours and wonder whether I'm going to get I mean, almost uh, week. I think yesterday you guys had a rehearsal, even though there's, we're not Holy Week, we're not in a, you know, uh, they have given at least on average three days a week uh, to their ministry. And it's shown and it has lifted people up in their grief. It's helped people heighten their sense of, 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 of what's going on in our, our spiritual story, our holy story. Uh, it has made... Christmas more joyous. It has made Good Friday more, uh, 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 more penetrating. It has been an incredible gift. Uh, and it just, uh, when I see you all here uh, as we lay a beloved friend to rest, and I, and I see you here in the kind of numbers uh, that you've been here during the week where you have to take time off work, uh, it is dropping your nets and saying, yes, I will follow. Speaking of cars out front, there are Alter Guild members that quietly come in and out of the church countless times during the week. Flower Guild members, I see cars there before I even get out of the house in the morning, uh, giving their Saturday mornings. Um, the Altar Guild who gave their Saturday morning yesterday uh, as they had their annual meeting. I see people 
spending their Saturdays and Sundays, a time that's a tremendous commodity in this day and age, uh, rolling up their sleeves, not doing the projects, the honey-do list in their own house, uh, but going out uh, and, and, and helping somebody uh, uh, whose, whose house is taking in water uh, rebuild a roof or uh, uh, rebuild a ramp or have better uh, uh, accessibility to their house or better security uh, or just a sense of a, a shelter over their house. I look at the people that do the busy work, the work that's not all that much fun, uh, the endowment work, the uh, securing loans, the figuring out when our loan payments will be due, the looking over the budget, uh, the, uh, the countless hours and hours and hours of meetings that go into the regular operation of a church, and then the capital campaign, and then the building project, the people that use their gifts uh, and spend hours upon hours uh, talking to architects, talking to contractors, uh, coming in and surveying our campus. Uh, it has been inspiring to see the number of people give the number of hours they have uh, to the church uh, over the past year. And I am uh, humbled to stand with leadership that has never, ever said, I don't have time. Funerals. This church, whether it's somebody who... Uh, and I spoke about the choir, but it's more than just the choir. Whether it's somebody who has a passing connection to St. James or somebody that's uh, sat in the pew since childhood, this church comes out and takes care of them. Uh, whether it's 500 people and food needing to come in and out of the kitchen uh, uh, by the second, or whether it's 15 people gathered from half the country away, a family who just needs a place to lay their loved ones to rest, you all stand tall and you offer your care and your hearts uh, and you drop your nets and you say yes. I will follow. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Our youth leaders. We have youth leaders that have given up uh, weeks of their life every year for the last decade, uh, who every uh, Sunday night, uh, instead of playing volleyball or hanging out with their family or, do, or just watching a football game or relaxing, uh, have committed to making sure that our young people, our teenagers, during a, a pretty turbulent time in their lives, know that they are made in the image of God, that they are lovable, and that they have a safe place to come and talk about their faith and to talk about what's challenging them in their lives. And we don't say thank you enough for them dropping their nets every Sunday evening uh, for a week over the 4th of July and for so many times in between to follow. <clears throat> Laura Updike, who when we were in a jam said, I'll be the, uh, uh, I'll take that on. You need somebody and I'll take it on. And then uh, after she had a full-time job, uh, two graduate courses and four boys to raise, still kept taking on that job until we had a replacement and for uh, that person uh, who after weeks of, uh, of hearing that invitation, uh, despite having young children at home and, and, and about five or six different ministries that she'd been pegged with, uh, Jennifer Taylor stepping up and saying, I'll fill in, you need somebody. And filling in more, more uh, than gracefully, phenomenally. For every day, Monday through Friday at St. James, uh, where uh, the head of school knows every single student by name first and last, in fact, does graduation without the names written down and has created a culture uh, where the teachers know likewise, whether it's the fifth grade teacher talking to a kindergartner uh, or each teacher uh, taking the time to know each individual student and knowing their, uh, their growing edges, uh, knowing their challenges, knowing their gifts and loving them and to being uh, the kind of teacher that helps them to grow even when it's more difficult for loving them enough to take the care and the time to meet their needs and to challenge them to grow. For an individual who spends uh, almost as much time as our full-time staff here, whether it's doing video ministry, whether it's filming something for the school, whether it's making sure some of our tech support works, whether it's uh, running our building project, uh, if it needs to be done, uh, this individual is here, and I can't imagine what we would be uh, like without him, and uh, I can't help but think uh, it's a critical uh, example of somebody dropping their net and following. The countless hands given hours upon hours through this construction process. To a moment last Friday, two days ago, when we're trying to make sure we had the financial numbers with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, accurately, with Laura uh, having been out for uh, December and January, as George talked about, uh, and Aaron uh, trying to learn all of this on the fly and wanting to make sure that what she presents to you is accurate, uh, at 5.30, 6 o'clock, while everybody else is starting their weekend, 
uh, Laura uh, drags her frail body in, unable to speak uh, with her husband, while Aaron and Laura work together, uh, uh, complimenting each other in the process, uh, communicating without words uh, to make sure uh, that the numbers uh, for the annual meeting are accurate and numbers for tomorrow's vestry meeting are accurate. Uh, and watching those two people have such care for the church uh, that they would uh, uh, be willing to, to give their time uh, and to work through, through adversity to be here. Or that race, the two people take almost a full-time job on top of their full-time lives uh, to make happen every year, uh, to, to secure sponsors, uh, to, 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 um, to set up the race course, to be able to get timers, uh, to be able to make t-shirts, uh, to get everybody lined up at all the different race points. Uh, it is inspiring. It's one of the countless examples, and I leave so much still on the table, of people dropping their nets and following. So when I get discouraged, I turn to those head-scratching moments that just don't make sense, that assure me that all is well, that through the noisiness of life, we are still listening to that call. Come, follow me. So because of you, because of moments of discipleship, moments of sacrifice, of carving out or prioritizing God's call to you, that I stand emboldened and ready for another great year. Like James before us, Christ is calling us to follow. The world needs us to follow. We need to follow. And I am confident in 2018 we will answer the call. Amen.